In 1888, London was the heart of the British Empire, yet it was a city of contrasts. While the West End boasted wealth and luxury, the East End, particularly Whitechapel, was notorious for poverty, overcrowding, and dismal living conditions. Many residents in Whitechapel were working class or impoverished, struggling daily for survival. Work was scarce, leading to high unemployment rates. The area was plagued by social problems like alcoholism and violence. For many women, prostitution was one of the few means of earning a living. They were vulnerable, not just to violence, but also to societal disdain and legal indifference. This period saw a growing awareness of the stark social inequalities. The plight of the East End's poor was beginning to garner attention, yet solutions were far from being implemented. Whitechapel's geography, with its narrow, dark alleys and dilapidated housing, created an environment where criminal activities could thrive and where someone like Jack the Ripper could easily evade capture. The dim gaslighting provided little illumination, creating pockets of darkness ideal for illicit activities and contributing to a sense of fear and foreboding among the residents. The Metropolitan Police, established in 1829, was still a relatively new institution, grappling with limited resources and techniques. Forensic science was in its infancy. The police relied more on witness testimonies and basic detective work, which were often insufficient for solving complex crimes. The era was marked by rapid industrialization, growing scientific interest, and a fascination with the macabre and gothic reflected in contemporary literature and arts. These elements combined to create a perfect storm, setting the stage for a predator like Jack the Ripper to emerge and terrify a city. Mary Ann Nichols, known as Polly, was born on August 26, 1845, in London. She led a life marred by misfortune and hardship. Married to William Nichols in 1864, the couple had five children. However, their marriage disintegrated, largely due to Polly's alcoholism. By 1888, she was living in Whitechapel, estranged from her family and in dire poverty. On the night of her murder, Polly was seen leaving a lodging house at 18 Thrall Street, having been unable to pay for a bed. She was later seen by her friend Ellen Holland at about 2.30 a.m. on Osborne Street, apparently intoxicated but in good spirits. Polly assured Ellen she would soon earn the money for her lodging. Charles Cross, on his way to work, discovered Polly's body on Bucks Row at about 3.40 a.m. Initially, he thought she was asleep. When Cross went closer, he realized the horror. Polly was dead, her throat deeply slashed, her dress soaked in blood. Another passerby, Robert Paul, joined him and they alerted a constable. Police arrived to find a gruesome scene. Besides the throat wounds, Polly's abdomen was savagely mutilated with deep, jagged cuts. The brutality was unlike anything seen before in Whitechapel. The murder sent shockwaves through the East End. The police began an intensive investigation, but with no witnesses and limited forensic methods, leads were scarce. Polly's death marked the first of the canonical five Jack the Ripper murders, setting off the infamous killing spree that would terrify London. The press coverage of Polly's murder was extensive, but sensationalised. Rumours and speculation ran rampant in the streets of Whitechapel. The community, already living in fear due to escalating violence in the area, was now gripped by the terror of an unidentified, brutal killer lurking in their midst. Polly Nichols's tragic end was just the beginning of a series of horrific crimes that would haunt London's history. Annie Chapman, born Eliza Ann Smith in 1841, led a life shadowed by personal tragedies. She married John Chapman, a coachman, in 1869, and they had three children. However, the death of their eldest child and John's alcoholism strained their marriage. By 1888, Annie was living in Whitechapel, estranged from her husband, who had left her for another woman. Her life was marked by destitution and declining health, exacerbated by alcoholism. On the morning of her death, 
Annie was seen walking the streets of Spitalfields. She had spent the previous night in a lodging house, but didn't have the four pence for her bed, so she left to earn the money. Witnesses later reported seeing her at Spitalfields Market around 5 a.m. and then talking to a dark-haired man near 29 Hanbury Street. At approximately 6 a.m., a resident of 29 Hanbury Street, John Davis, found Annie's body in the backyard. The scene was horrifying. Her throat was slashed, and her abdomen was grotesquely mutilated. More chilling was the precision of the mutilations. Her uterus had been surgically removed and taken away by the killer, suggesting a disturbing level of anatomical knowledge. The police launched a thorough investigation, interviewing numerous witnesses and residents of Hanbury Street. However, no conclusive evidence was found. Annie's murder was linked to Polly Nichols's due to the similar nature of the wounds and the proximity of the two crimes. The brutality of Annie's murder intensified the fear in Whitechapel. The press coverage was rampant, with newspapers often sensationalising the gruesome details. The public began to speculate wildly about the identity of the killer, coining him Leather Apron and later Jack the Ripper. Annie Chapman's murder marked a terrifying escalation in the Ripper's modus operandi, with a level of brutality and precision that baffled and horrified both the public and the police. Next, we will explore the chilling events of the double event, the murders of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes. Elizabeth Stride, born in Sweden in 1843, came to London in 1866. She had a troubled marriage with John Stride, a ship's carpenter, but they separated after falsely claiming to be a victim of the Princess Alice steamship disaster in 1878. By 1888, Elizabeth, known as Long Liz, was living in Whitechapel, surviving through casual work and prostitution. On the night of September 29th, Elizabeth was seen in various pubs and lodging houses. Witnesses reported seeing her with different men throughout the night. Her last known interaction was with a man near Dutfield's yard off Burner Street around midnight. Louis Diemschutz, a steward of a Jewish socialist club in Dutfield's yard, discovered her body at approximately 1 a.m. while turning his pony cart into the yard. Stride's body was found with a single cut to the throat, but unlike previous Ripper victims, there were no abdominal mutilations. The lack of mutilation led to speculation that the Ripper was interrupted during this attack. The murder of Elizabeth Stride prompted a massive police response with detectives combing the area for clues. However, within the same hour, another murder occurred, shifting the focus of both the police and the horrified public. Elizabeth Stride's murder, while differing in its lack of mutilation, contributed to the growing terror in Whitechapel, and her death is widely accepted as part of the Ripper's brutal series. The night was far from over, though, as another murder was about to unfold, deepening the horror of the double event. Catherine Eddowes, also known as Kate Conway, and Mary Ann Kelly, was born in 1842 in Wolverhampton. She had a common law marriage with Thomas Conway and later lived with John Kelly, but by 1888 she was living a transient life in Whitechapel. On September 29th, Catherine was arrested for drunkenness and released from police custody around 1 a.m. on September 30th. She was last seen alive by three witnesses in the company of a man at the corner of Church Street and Duke Street around 1.35 a.m. Catherine's mutilated body was discovered at 1.45 a.m. in Mitre Square by P.C. Watkins. Her throat had been cut and her abdomen was horrifically mutilated. The killer had removed her kidney and part of her uterus and her face was slashed, indicating a significant escalation in violence. The proximity in time and manner of death to Elizabeth Stride's murder led the police to link the two crimes. A bloodied piece of Eddow's apron was found in Goulston Street, along with a chalk message found on a wall that became a controversial piece of evidence. The chalk message found near the site of Catherine Eddow's murder read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. 
The meaning and intent of the message have been the subject of much debate and speculation. Some interpretations suggest it was an anti-Semitic remark, as J-U-W-E-S could be interpreted as a misspelling of Jews, while others believe it may have had nothing to do with the murder and was simply graffiti. Due to concerns about the potential for anti-Semitic backlash and public unrest, the police commissioner, Sir Charles Warren, ordered the message to be erased before it could be photographed, a decision that has been criticised in retrospect for potentially destroying valuable evidence. The true significance of the message and whether it was actually written by the Ripper remains unknown. The double event caused unprecedented panic. The brutality of the murders, especially Edo's, shocked the public conscience. Vigilante groups formed and the press feverishly reported on the killings with the mysterious and evasive killer dubbed Jack the Ripper. The murders of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes in a single night exemplified the Ripper's brutal capacity and the terrifying randomness of his attacks. The fear and chaos that followed these murders underscored the helpless state of the police and the terror that gripped Whitechapel. Next, we'll delve into the story of Mary Jane Kelly, the Ripper's final and most horrific murder. Mary Jane Kelly, believed to have been born around 1863 in Ireland, was the youngest and the last of the canonical five victims. Her life, shrouded in mystery, involved a series of relationships, often marred by violence. By 1888, Kelly was living in a single room at 13 Millers Court, off Dorset Street, one of the worst slums in London. Kelly was last seen alive on the night of November 8th, returning to her room with a man. Witnesses recalled hearing her singing in the early hours of November 9th. Her life in Whitechapel was fraught with hardship. Descriptions of her suggest she was well-liked, but often found herself in tumultuous relationships and struggled with alcohol. On the morning of November 9th, Thomas Bowyer, a rent collector, went to Kelly's room. Peering through a broken window, he discovered a horrifying scene. Kelly's body lay on the bed, mutilated beyond recognition. The ferocity of the attack was unprecedented. Her throat slashed down to the spine, her abdomen emptied of its organs, and her face hacked beyond all semblance of identity. The room was small, and the walls splattered with blood, indicating the brutality and frenzy of the attack. The police were summoned and the scene was meticulously examined, but the lack of forensic science limited the investigation. Kelly's murder was by far the most gruesome, suggesting that the killer had ample time and privacy to carry out his barbaric act. The murder of Mary Jane Kelly marked the zenith of the Ripper panic. The graphic details, when made public, caused a sensation and deep fear across London. The press coverage was extensive, with newspapers publishing lurid details and illustrations of the crime scene. Kelly's murder is generally considered the final act in the Ripper's killing spree. The brutality of her death marked the horrific climax of a series of murders that had terrorised London. The mystery surrounding her life and death, like that of the Ripper, remains a source of fascination and speculation to this day. Mary Jane Kelly's tragic fate, characterized by its extreme brutality, closed the chapter on the Ripper's known murders. Her story is not just a tale of horror, but a poignant reminder of the vulnerability of those living on the margins of society in Victorian London. These detailed accounts of each victim paint a vivid and harrowing picture of the Ripper's reign of terror in 1888 London. Each story, while unique in its tragedy, collectively underscores the social vulnerabilities and grim realities of the time. Next, we will explore the extensive investigation efforts that followed these gruesome crimes. After Mary Ann Nichols' murder, the Metropolitan Police initiated an investigation, but it was hindered by limited forensic technology and understanding of serial offences. The police conducted house-to-house -house inquiries and collected hundreds of statements, but the lack of eyewitnesses and tangible evidence proved challenging. As more murders occurred, the complexity of the case escalated. The police faced mounting public pressure and media scrutiny. Each crime scene was meticulously examined, 
but the lack of advanced forensic methods made it difficult to gather conclusive evidence. The murders occurred in areas patrolled by both the Metropolitan Police and the City of London Police, leading to jurisdictional complications and communication issues between the two forces. Traditional methods such as tracking suspicious characters, interviewing witnesses and following up on tips were employed extensively. Bloodhounds were used in an attempt to track the killer, a method that was experimental and ultimately unsuccessful. Detectives like inspectors Frederick Aberline, Henry Moore and Walter Andrews played significant roles, but they were handicapped by the limitations of the period's investigative techniques. Forensic science was in its infancy. The concept of fingerprinting was not yet established, and DNA analysis was a century away. Autopsies provided crucial details about the manner of deaths, but offered little in identifying the killer. The continuous failure to capture the murderer led to the formation of vigilante patrols by local residents. The Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, formed by local businessmen, even offered a reward for information leading to the arrest of the killer. The transient nature of Whitechapel's population, the prevalent darkness of its streets, and the general distrust of the police among the local community compounded the difficulties of the investigation. The sheer volume of suspects and leads, many of which were based on xenophobic and classist biases rather than evidence, overwhelmed the police. The intense media coverage and sensationalism added pressure, but also misinformation, making the investigation even more challenging. The investigation into the Jack the Ripper murders was one of the most extensive of its time, yet it was marred by the limitations of contemporary law enforcement techniques and social prejudices. The inability to capture the killer not only left the case unsolved, but also contributed to the legend and mystery surrounding Jack the Ripper that continues to fascinate the world. Next, we will delve into the public reaction and the media frenzy that surrounded these infamous murders. The Ripper murders created an atmosphere of fear and paranoia in Whitechapel. The brutality of the crimes and the killer's ability to evade capture terrified the local residents. Women, in particular, feared for their safety, and the streets of the East End, usually bustling at night, became desolate after dark. The press played a crucial role in shaping public perception of the murders. Newspapers were filled with detailed accounts of the killings, often embellished to attract readers. Sensational headlines and graphic descriptions created a morbid fascination among the public, extending far beyond Whitechapel. The lack of concrete information led to rampant speculation and rumours. Theories about the killer's identity ranged from a butcher to a physician and even to members of the upper class. Xenophobia was rampant, with suspicion often falling on Jewish and immigrant communities in the East End. There were public protests against the perceived incompetence of the police, with demands for better protection and calls for the resignation of top officials. The media's sensationalism reached its peak with the publication of letters purportedly written by the Ripper. Here are the complete transcripts of the most infamous letters. Dear boss, I'm, uh, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fit. I am down on whores and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. <laughs> the next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers, just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work and then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving the trade name. P.S. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all the red ink off my hands. Curse it. No luck yet. They say I'm a doctor now. Huh. The Dear Boss letter, with its taunting tone and reference to future crimes, was the first to use the name Jack the Ripper. The mention of 
clipping the lady's ears off seem to reference the future murder of Catherine Eddowes, where one of her earlobes was cut. I was not codding, dear old boss, when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jackie's work tomorrow double event. This time, number one squealed a bit. Couldn't finish straight off. Ha, huh, not the time to get ears for police. Thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. The Saucy Jack postcard referenced the double event, the murders of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, suggesting the writer had knowledge of the crimes. It also continued the mocking tone seen in the Dear Boss letter. From hell, Mr. Lusk. Sir, I send you half the kidden I took from one woman, preserved it for you. The other piece I fried and ate it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. The From Hell letter was distinct in its more crude and menacing tone. The inclusion of part of a kidney, purportedly from Catherine Eddowes, added a gruesomely tangible element to the Ripper's taunts. These letters, whether genuine or hoaxes, contributed to the public's terror and the media frenzy surrounding the Ripper murders. They remain a subject of fascination and debate among Ripperologists and historians. The enigma of Jack the Ripper's identity has led to a plethora of suspects and theories, ranging from the plausible to the bizarre, each reflecting the societal anxieties and forensic limitations of the time. Among the most notable suspects was Montague John Druitt, a barrister and teacher whose suicide shortly after the last known Ripper murder cast a shadow of suspicion over him. The absence of direct evidence notwithstanding, Druitt's mental health issues and his family's history with mental illness have often been cited as circumstantial evidence in theories linking him to the murders. Another prominent suspect was Aaron Kosminski, a Polish-Jewish hairdresser living in Whitechapel. He was known to have suffered from severe mental illness and recent forensic investigations involving a shawl purportedly linked to Catherine Eddowes's murder suggested a DNA match with his relatives. However, the authenticity of the shawl and the accuracy of the DNA analysis have been subjects of intense debate, casting doubt on the conclusiveness of these findings. The list of suspects also includes Michael Ostrog, a Russian criminal known for his violent behaviour and history of mental illness. His whereabouts during the murders were uncertain, making him a suspect in some theories, albeit without direct evidence linking him to the crimes. Similarly, George Chapman, born Severin Klosowski, a Polish barber surgeon known for poisoning his wives, was considered a suspect due to his medical knowledge and presence in Whitechapel during the murders. Despite his modus operandi being significantly different from that of the Ripper, the case also saw the emergence of James Maybrick, a Liverpool cotton merchant, as a suspect following the discovery of a diary in the 1990s purportedly written by him and confessing to the Ripper murders. This diary's authenticity, however, has been widely contested, with many experts deeming it a modern forgery. Beyond individual suspects, the Ripper case has been rife with conspiracy theories, including claims of royal involvement and Masonic rituals, often lacking concrete evidence and considered fringe by mainstream historians. Modern criminal profiling and investigative techniques have retrospectively suggested that the Ripper was likely a male familiar with the area, harboring significant animosity towards women. However, the absence of definitive evidence means these profiles remain speculative. The question of why the case remains unsolved is rooted in the limitations of Victorian-era policing, the loss of evidence over time, and the lack of advanced forensic techniques during the period of the murders. The enduring mystery of Jack the Ripper's identity, coupled with the case's sensational nature, has solidified its place in the annals of criminal history, continuing to intrigue and horrify to this day. The story of Jack the Ripper is just the start of our journey through London's history. This city has been shaped by many stories, both famous and not so well known. As we explore these stories, we invite you to join us. If you liked learning about Jack the Ripper, 
and want to discover more about London's past, please like and subscribe. Let us know what you think about Jack the Ripper below. Did you learn something new? What parts of London's history do you find most interesting? Share your thoughts and they'll help us decide which parts of London's history to explore next. Stay tuned for more stories as we time travel into London's past.